Hi, everyone. Welcome to Brain Talks. I'm Deborah Khan, founder of Being Patient. Today, we're going to talk about cannabis. Um, a lot of you have written in or commented on past articles we have posted on Being Patient um, about the use of cannabis um, in dementia patients. Now, um, we're happy to tell you that um, we don't have the answer about the efficacy yet, but it is being studied um, out of King's College in London. Joining me now is one of the lead researchers. His name is Chris Alberton. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me. So, Chris, let's first just talk about um, the the cannabis that you are using in this study. Um, it's it's in the form of, of a I think a droplet. Is is that correct? Uh, close. Uh, it's it's an oral solution, but it's administered as a spray actually. So an oral spray. Um, it's called Satvex. It's actually licensed in the U.S. as well uh, as well as the EU and the U.K. Uh, but for MS, so multiple sclerosis. Um, and we're looking to really repurpose it and investigate its utility uh, in dementia, specifically for agitation and aggressive symptoms. Now, the history, though, behind this is that it was it was used for MS and found to be um, very effective. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So it really helps to uh, target those joint and uh, musculoskeletal issues um, and, and reduce pain in that sort of uh, area as well, so joint pain. And really loosen things up, yeah. So why was the association made with Sativix and um, dementia? Um, what what was the connection there? Yeah, well, I suppose if, if I first just start with um, the problem we're trying to address, which is these sort of behavioral symptoms in dementia, which are quite understandable when, uh, someone, when a um, patient is feeling very confused and out of sorts, not really aware where they are. So it's understandable they could get quite agitated and perhaps aggressive. So that's the symptom we're sort of trying to target. Uh, currently, there's um, a scarcity of, of treatments, pharmacological treatments out there, uh, and some of them are rather damaging and dangerous, especially in the long term. So they would prescribe off-label antipsychotics, for instance, um, for the more severe cases of agitation. Um, so that's just nesting it within the sort of context, and that comes with sort of adverse health outcomes for the individual, for the carers, support team as well as sort of economic impact on hospitals and so forth. Um, so what we're really looking to do is, and we're looking for a safer, but just as effective, if not more effective alternative. Um, and so we're not the only ones who's actually explored the utility of cannabis in this area. Um, I think you've actually alluded to on your site previously, um, a Canadian uh, research team, as well as I think there's a team at Johns Hopkins uh, as well that have done some research in this area. Um, and it's, it's growing internationally as well. Um, but they're all sort of pilot studies. They're, they're looking very promising. Uh, we're, we're quite excited about the potential of this area. So the um, small but promising studies that have shown um, sort of estimated efficacy for agitation and dementia. Um, so, no, I was going to ask um, the side of it. Uh, now, what's interesting about um, medical cannabis is there's really, I mean, it's in America, obviously, it's legal um, mm. and for recreational or um, medical in a lot of states, um, increasingly more. Um, the, the way that um, it's being cultivated is very specific now um, to a lot of uh, health um, issues. My question is, when you're using the Sativix, how, like, what's the difference or in concentration of CBD versus um, THC, which are the two components in um, in uh, cannabis that have found to be more effective? So, what is what is that balance between the two, and what do we know separately about how those two interact with with behavior? Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so yeah, THC and CBD are, are known as cannabinoids actually, they're part of a, a wide array of um, compounds that come from the cannabis plant, so just two of hundreds actually, but the, you're correct that the two main ones that we know of at the moment. Uh, THC, THC is the, uh, the psychoactive compound, it's the one where you get that subjective high feeling, um, but it's also been found as the compound most reliably to induce a therapeutic effect. Um, that was just most recently reported in Nature uh, this February even. Um, CBD itself 
uh, has also been growing, uh, had some growing interest. Uh, uh, it's important to note that the, the concentration, so the dose, is uh, very important when referring to cannabinoid compounds, and a lot of lab scientists uh, are looking into that to make sure that, uh, for instance, you only need 2.55 milligrams THC to have an effect, but you need it in the hundreds of CBD, for instance, um, to really achieve a, a therapeutic effect. Um, now with Sativex, it's a, it's a one-to-one -one, uh, concoction. So we've got half CBD, half, CBD, half THC. Um, and what I didn't mention before actually is, so the way that it's administered is through an oral spray. And so it's a spray into the mouth. Um, so it, it's not inhaled or not ingested or swallowed. Um, so that's a highly, highly innovative method, for, particularly in the dementia population as well, that we're excited to explore. Um, but in each one of those sprays, you get 2.5 milligrams THC and a 2.5, maybe it's 2.7 uh, CBD. So it's important to note that the CBD isn't actually have a, having a therapeutic effect in itself. It's augmenting and working synergistically with the THC component. That's interesting. Okay, we're start, we're starting to get some questions. Um, sure. And one um, comment from a, a viewer saying, thank you for your research. My mom has been on several different antipsychotics for agitation with Alzheimer's and they've caused her to greatly decline. Um, she always ends up so drugged up and has to be taken off the drugs. We need something better for Alzheimer's patients. Mm -hmm. This actually brings up um, a good point, which is, you know, that's we hear this a lot with the current antipsychotic medications. There is a lot of side effects that go with them, and they actually, mm -hmm. um, in a lot of cases, end up worse for the for the person um, with dementia. Do you are are there any known side effects um, with from um, side effects? Um, yeah, so with any compound, you have to be realistic about the risks versus benefit ratio, and that's really down to the clinician doing the prescribing to make that uh, decision, to make that evaluation. Um, with Sativex, actually, in comparison to those other antipsychotics, it's a relatively innocuous substance. Um, so we're looking at side effects along the lines of uh, increased dizziness, perhaps, uh, dry mouth as well is a common one, um, and then just perhaps risk of increased risk of falls, for instance, um, particularly in an elderly population. Uh, you wouldn't want to uh, necessarily administer it with someone with severe cardiac uh, issues or a history of cardiac disease. Um, and thankfully, I mean, because this is already a licensed drug and it's gone through that rigorous and objective uh, safety profiling um, assessment, we're really, we have much better awareness of what the physiological risks are as well. So, for instance, as part of this trial, we are able to look at the summary of characteristics and contraindications uh, and then pre-screen for these. So any sort of drug-to-drug -drug interactions that we're, uh, we're worried about or any history of cardiac disease or significant uh, psychiatric illness. So if there's a history of uh, significant psychosis or depression, uh, then we will screen for that and exclude those as participants, for instance. And that's something that would happen in practice as well. So now, just to be clear, the study ha actually hasn't started yet. It's starting, I believe, in September. Is that correct? That is correct, yes. So okay. we're just in setup. So tell us a little bit, though, about how extensive um, the study will be and um, how long we will know before uh, determining whether there is um, effect. Yeah, no, absolutely. So the, the study itself will run for just over a year, I think about 15 months, where we're uh, collecting data and recruiting participants. Um, and our aim as academics, especially clinical academics, we want to get the information out there as soon as possible. So within a, a few months of finishing the trial, we're hoping to publish uh, and really uh, inform uh, other scientists, other clinicians, as well as the public um, to uh, the results of the study, with the aim to then move on to a, a larger trial where we could really look at the efficacy. Um, because, I mean, that is an important point just to touch on. Uh, that this is just a pilot study at the moment. We're just looking at the feasibility and acceptability of the treatment, um, whether or not it, it's it's good in practice, like if, uh, if nurses in nursing homes are uh, finding it helpful, and then we can have an estimate of efficacy uh, following this trial. So the initial pilot will, it will, how, how many people will it involve? 
We've got 60 people. Uh, we'll be randomizing. So we're using a randomized control design with a placebo. So 30 people will be on the treatment, 30 people uh, on a placebo. So we can really get a good direct comparison. Um, and of, of course, the, uh, if the patient or the resident won't know which they're on, and neither will the researchers. That really increases the power of the study. So there's um, no sort of uh, bias or risk of bias in that sense. So, you know, we've been asked this question before, and I'm, I'm not sure anyone knows the answer, but why is it being targeted towards behavioral? And there, there have been some early stage, um, early onset, uh, people with early onset who have asked, well, does anyone actually know if this helps to slow down um, the deterioration, you know, of, of, of brought on by dementia? Um, I have never heard of a study before, but it's interesting that um, it's the behavioral um, um, antipsychotic side of things where people yeah. start to, you know, uh, that that this this trial is being um, uh, targeted at. And I'm just wondering why why I mean, with with uh, dementia, there are um, a lot of different problems from behavioral to physical. So why was it targeted towards the behavioral um, aspect? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for when we when we just looked at look at the, uh, the impact or the effect of cannabis consumption, and you sort of think about just even on, on lay terms the the impact it has. We think of increased drowsiness, a um, bit more of a calm, relaxed feeling. Um, you sort of associate those with uh, um, with a therapeutic potential to to uh, in a behavioural sense. And now, when you're talking about more the uh, uh, the disease specific or the pathology of uh, dementia and, and that's a wide array I and mean, you've got different types of dementias so that's the first thing to uh, clarify. Uh, there have been some um, exciting lab results, yes you're correct about uh, targeting some of the uh, underlying causes of dementia um, but it's it's been really difficult and actually translating it up to uh, in-person studies um, has not been successful so uh, just yet. Um, but it's an exciting avenue for the future, absolutely. And considering that uh, cannabis is in this sort of societal shift of a real focus towards and hopefully a bit more funding and uh, um, attention goes into the research. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to see what we can find. You know, this is probably an example of um, the research now catching up to, um, you know, especially in the US where, where, as I said, it's legal in so many places. <laughs> You know, we often have people writing in saying they're trying it on their their loved one. Um, not mm. that we would ever recommend that anyone try anything that hasn't been researched, but it's interesting to see kind of the research is actually catching up to a point where you know people um, don't have the scientific um, evidence behind a study, which um, mm. it, it it is as you pointed out moving in that direction, um, which is good. Um, but you know everything is always better tested by science. Um, to have have the proof. Um, we we have a question actually from a viewer coming in saying, how do we get into the study? Like, are you gonna be recruiting? And is it only in London? Um, how, how would people find out more um, and keep abreast of your research and understand if there's a possibility of joining in a study? Uh, well, at the moment, as I said, we're just in the setup stage. Uh, unfortunately, it is just uh, a UK centric study specifically uh, closer to London if possible, because obviously our research team has to travel out to these care homes and nursing homes um, to conduct the assessments and, and bring the drug to the to the nurses. Um, so it's it's quite local for the time being. I am excited and and, and hopeful that if the if it's promising results that we could take it international, that we could do a multi-center study uh, to really look at um, impact across the world. You know, in Canada, in the US, Australia, and so forth. Um, I would say if, if you did want to learn more about the study, uh, I'm not sure of, of the, the process of, of this talk, but I, I can leave some links that go direct to our um, biomedical research center, which has a page on it at the moment. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter if, you, if you'd like, and uh, I'll, I'll pin a tweet at the top to, to have access to. Uh, but really, uh, it's look out this autumn. That's when we'll be really pushing and driving, uh, and you can get in touch with, uh, and we'll have confirmed participant information sheets uh, and materials to, to send out and so forth. That's great. We, we will, um, we can post those links um, in the, the Facebook live thread um, so that sure. people 
get to them. Um, I'm curious, are you targeting a specific age or, or or are you testing all ages? I mean, you're talking about nursing homes, so I'm assuming that's elder, more elderly people, but you know, what about the, the younger population of people living with dementia? Yeah, I mean, so uh, you, you kindly labeled this this interview as sort of like the first major study, which is, is very uh, um, flattering, but I'm not too sure it's, it's not quite true. There are a couple other uh, studies as well, uh, but it is in the UK, so that is something. So what we really had to be careful of is to make sure that we're conducting this experiment in a controlled, measured setting where we can be really careful about any potential risks um, especially because it's such a buzzword, you know, if, if anything goes wrong from a cannabis medication, just, just the one, um, and if, if it seemed to be irresponsibly used, uh, that could really scupper a lot of um, future work and future attention to the, to the therapeutic potential. Um, so when it comes to age, it was really, uh, we wanted to be as inclu inclusive, inclusive as possible, to be honest. So. Uh, we chose nursing homes because it's that structure where it can be a trained clinician to administer the drug and it can be uh, monitored at the impact and so forth. Um, but really, it's, so any age uh, in a nursing home is likely to be more severe dementia. So that's also likely to be older. Um, and then finally, we do, we've put an age cap at 90. And I wasn't, uh, this is a, Object of, of debate, let's say, just because I um, uh, the, the the lab studies and sort of the the first in human studies, they only recruited. I think the highest age was up to ninety, and that's in the, the summary of the Satavix um, product characteristics. Um, but really, I think it, it could go beyond. But just to be safe, we wanted to keep it within that bracket. And we have a, a que another question coming in um, from a viewer saying, thanks for joining us. Will this study include dementia patients in the community setting or only in residential care? Uh, yes, so we're just targeting residential care at the moment. Uh, there are a couple of studies in, uh, in the pipeline where we're hoping to expand into community also. Uh, but as I said, it's, it's where uh, we, it's, it's much harder to, to monitor the risks and monitor the uh, the compliance, for instance, of how often the drug is taken and so forth. Um, but that's that's a, a future step, absolutely, because we want to be able to expand the, th the therapeutic potential uh, across the board so that it can have, be accessed by, by everyone who would need it. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Chris, what's your Twitter? Uh, so we could tell people, where, what, what's your Twitter handle? Uh, yes, uh, it's just uh, at underscore Chris Alberton. Okay, great. So to keep abreast of uh, the study, follow Chris on Twitter or we'll post some links uh, to your uh, research center uh, at King's College. Uh, we'll, we'll post uh, the link to that page um, mm -hmm. so that you can all uh, uh, keep keep up with the, the trial. Chris, please um, let us know when you get any information. We'd like to stay on top of this um, and we'd like to let people know uh, what, what research is telling us um, about the use of cannabis in, in, dementia, in dementia patients. So we're very appreciative of your time. Thank you so much. No, absolutely. And likewise, and I, I have to reiterate, I know I said before the call, but the work that you're doing with beingpatient.com is, is just fantastic. And I'm it's really exciting to see a platform gain so much, um, so much momentum. So, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. And we will look forward to keeping in touch. Um, we'll come back to you uh, maybe after the, the first pilot has finished and let people know how it went. And we wish you all the luck. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much. Okay, take care. Take care. Thank you.